Good morning and welcome to Our Issues Milwaukee. I'm your host, Andrea Williams. October, of course, is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in women, exceeded only by lung cancer. And this year, an estimated 230,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women, and about 40,000 women will die from breast cancer. And male breast cancer is rare and accounts for only about 1% of all breast cancers, but you'll find out today that it is, in fact, very real. Both of my guests are well known for their skills and knowledge when it comes to the game of football, but they also know all too well the devastating effects breast cancer can have on a family. It is my pleasure to welcome Gilbert Brown, former nose tackle for the Green Bay Packers, and George Koontz, who is a former linebacker for the Pack. Good morning, fellas. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Wow, what a pleasant <coughs> surprise to have former Packers here to talk about something that uh, is so serious. And I appreciate you guys doing that today. Of course, we're going to talk a little football as this conversation goes on. But first, uh, I really uh, want to focus on your stories and how breast cancer has changed uh, your life. Well, it's very, very devastating for me because, you know, my wife at the time, uh, she was six months pregnant, 35 years old, being diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, fighting that, that deadly uh, disease for about three and a half years, and she passed away back in. Uh, October 7th, mm. uh, you know, 2009. So it kind of changed the whole family dynamic for me, but I was able to get through it because I have a, a great support system, I have a great family here in Milwaukee. The Daniels family, Miss Irma Daniels, she was leading uh, the effort to make sure I had the, the proper resources, the, pro the proper counseling to make sure I was okay. Yeah, and you're speaking of uh, Holy Redeemer yes, Church, yes, uh, yes. the Daniels there, and uh, you had small kids. I had small kids, you know, my, my uh, mother-in-law at the time, she moved in, I moved to, uh, from North Carolina to Milwaukee to, to help me take care of the kids. and. And that was very, very difficult, mm -hmm. you know, because we were 1,200 miles away from home. We didn't have a family, uh, you know, a local family here in the area. So it was very, very tough. Therefore, the, you know, my, my friends and my family over at Holy Redeemer really stepped up to help me uh, through that very uh, tre tremendous uh, pain that I was going through. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. And uh, we always hear people say that when someone's diagnosed with something like cancer, then the whole family is affected. And Gilbert, uh, you lost your brother to breast cancer. And it's not uh, every day that we hear about uh, a man suffering from breast cancer. A lot of times people right. use Richard Roundtree, the actor, as an example. But I don't know of any others that could serve as an example that breast cancer is real when it comes to men. So talk a little bit about your story. Well, it's, just, it's, a, well, it's a crushing story, but uh, it's a case of uh, us men not liking to go to the doctor. Mm. I mean, we don't like to go get our checkups. We don't like to do a lot of different things. So my brother's case, he had the growth on his chest for like two years before he even done anything about it, you know? And um, by that time, it was too late. It was mm. stage four and, and going into uh, panic mode. And uh, it's just one of those things where uh, <clears throat> somebody that close to you that you, he, he was actually my little brother. So mm. somebody that close to you that you, grown attached to and see he's being successful. He, he's working for GM. He was a CAD designer for GM and mm. I mean, everything was going great for him, you know, and then all of a sudden um, this uh, horrible disease jumped on him and and then, and then there's something where you got to sit there and watch him deteriorate. Yeah, uh, and they, yeah. They, you, you're saying there was a growth there, so something he could physically see, yes. but was it something he kind of just blew off and yes. thought well, of? Like, like, all, like all us men, we don't like going to the doctor. You yeah, know, we feel like we're too tough or we're, we got this pride about ourselves. Invincible. Or invincible, whatever <clears throat> it is, and thinking it's something else and didn't go, so. Yeah, that's interesting you say <clears throat> that, because right here I have uh, how important it is to spread the awareness, because when it comes to men, right. Mm -hmm. They have a tendency to ignore cancer screenings and preventative health visits, and those who do not get screened often do so at a woman's urging. So uh, I do appreciate you guys sharing your story, but I know there are people who are wondering, uh, what are some of the things that contributed to your brother uh, getting breast cancer? Did it run in your family in some way? What information were you given? No, I mean, um, from what I know about uh, no one in my family has had breast cancer mm. so it's, it's, it's just you know they say it may skip generations or this that and the other I don't know but um, 
uh, for him to have that was a shock to everybody because um, my fam no one in my family has ever had cancer. So Wow. Mm -hmm. And so does that urge you both uh, in these type of situations to realize how important it is to get those checkups and to make sure that everything's all good? Most absolutely. absolutely, most definitely, because Tanisha didn't have any family history mm -hmm. either when it came to breast cancer or mm -hmm. cancer in general. You know, but when she went for uh, you know monthly routine because she was pregnant at the time to to get that type of devastating news, it was not only it was past shocking. Wow. So. Uh, so why is it important? Well, it's obvious why it's so important for you guys to talk about it and to spread awareness, but uh, what does it do for you? Is it healing for you to be able to uh, kind of share your story to help other people who may be going through the same thing or to at least uh, encourage others to go to the doctor, especially women? We always say, got to get that mammogram. You have to get that mammogram, but also, too, I want to talk about it because I just want to uh, bring the awareness uh, to uh, to, to the disease, to the deadly disease, but also, most importantly, talking to a lot of men because if they're going through it, that their spouse is going through it, mm -hmm. they need to talk, to, you know, to their job to find out the different policies and procedures at work where they could take the time off. I was working at Marquette University at the time, and they gave me the leeway to take Tanisha to uh, Sloan Kettering in New York. I took her down to Chicago. I took her to Madison to different doctors and mm -hmm. hospitals, trying to find a cure. So if there's any men out there, make sure you find out at work how much time can you take mm -hmm. off. If there's some, some, some counseling that you need to go through, you know, I wanted to take counseling. So I was very, very, uh, trying to be very progressive on the front end. Trying oh, to, I love that. Yeah. that is, uh, it's great information to share. And Gilbert, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, actually, um, <clears throat> even if it was a teammate, brother, family member, whatever, you know, and I wouldn't wish that on seeing what my brother went through. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy as well. I mean, because uh, it's a slow, painful thing for me to sit there and watch him right. Right, deteriorate like that. And then to see your mother and your brothers and sisters and everybody else, you know, and everybody's trying to do something to, you know, combat that. But also, when I'm out here and doing the things that I do, I try a little bit of spreading my word a little bit here, a little bit there, because like I said, as a man, <clears throat> we hate walking through those doors. I hate the smell of hospitals, yeah. you know, I, it's just, I don't even think the beds are big enough for me, so <laughs> I think, I think, I, but, but still, if I can go do it, anybody else can go do it. So yeah, every I six months that. I go get checked out. Gilbert didn't even like going into the training room when he was in uh, really? Upper Lambeau. They used to bring ice and everything to his house. He, <laughs> he used to give treatment, didn't he Gilbert? <laughs> well, I, I can just tell just from when Gilbert arrived, I could tell Gilbert had to be a hoot to be around oh, in the was, locker room. Um, man, I wish I had um, <laughs> a, a video phone. I wish I had an iPhone back then. <laughs> they didn't make them back you then. You'd be working for me. Lucky you, lucky you. You'd be working for me if I had an iPhone. <laughs> well, I do. In all seriousness, I want to thank you guys oh, for sharing welcome. those stories. Yes. And I do love how the NFL uh, has yeah. adopted this whole concept of wearing pink to bring awareness uh, to uh, this whole scenario as well. And speaking of the NFL, of course, right. uh, there are people at home who are saying, you got to talk football. So I want to look back on the journey that brought you guys to where you are today. Uh, not all the way back to when you were born, but you are from a small town. Yes. Uh, is it New Bern? New Bern. North in Carolina. North Carolina and Gilbert you're from the big city of Detroit Eight mile. and uh, <laughs> you both ended up in Green Bay right around right. the same time I love that Coons you played with the pack from 92 to 99 yes. Gilbert you played from 93 to 99 and then from 2001 to 2003 which means mm -hmm. you share that very special bond right. of winning Super Bowl 31 together. Exactly, and our lockers was next to each other for about yes. seven, eight years as wow. well. So that was my locker mate, and uh, he was one of the best, probably my favorite Packer of all time. Really? Gilbert Brown, Leroy Butler, and, and the great, late Reggie White. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. So that just brings my next question. What are your favorite memories of playing ball in Green Bay? My favorite memory was uh, when, when we signed Reggie White, I think April the 6th, mm -hmm. to, uh, 1993. And watching Reggie, you know, because we had a vision of bringing uh, the Lombardi Trophy back to uh, Wisconsin and seeing Reggie run around um, the field down in New Orleans with the trophy. I remember that. that Everybody was, remembers that. Right over his head. That's my favorite memory. The whole arena. Right. <laughs>
-hmm. He had that trophy right over. But his I wanted head. I wanted my favorite memory to be when we used to be try try to beat Minnesota in Minnesota because uh, Gilbert went to the Vikings when he first came out of the University of Kansas. Uh -huh. they, let, they let Gilbert go and he came to us and. We'll up, talk about that because uh, you guys have something in common with those first teams you went to as well. But I want to know, and I, I tease Leroy Butler about this all the time. I'm like, you're from Florida, right. and you decided to stay in the frozen tundra. What's up with that? <laughs> so you guys, uh, I mean, you're used to the cold. But mm -hmm. what kept you here in Wisconsin? Uh, what is it that makes this place so special that you chose to just kind of uh, ground yourself here and make a difference in this community? Well, for me, it's the tradition. The fans, right. you know, um, Green Bay has a, a fan base that's not just in Wisconsin. Uh, I've seen it. Man, we went over to Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. People over in Tokyo, <laughs> they thought I was Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Buddha. Yeah, Buddha. Yeah. But, really? uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we we as a team, um, putting that G on the side of our helmet and going out there and playing on Lambeau Field was something very special. In Green Bay, they had this hallway that you walk, that we used to walk in every day uh, to go to work, and they had all these banners of championships and all that. And from the first day I ever came to Green Bay to the last day I, I was a Packer, the hair on the back of my neck still stand up wow. when I'm walking down the hallway. That's awesome because that tradition really does not exist in any other franchise. No, you don't get it's that just Minnesota. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, practice. Chicago. Exactly. They still suck. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, for you, what kept you here in Wisconsin? Well, I, I, I can uh, agree with everything that Gilbert said. Just the community. Yeah. And the fans truly love their players. And they wanted to see their players be successful. Yeah. You, know? you guys won that Super Bowl a while ago, and you're still rock stars. Yeah, you know, like right. people see you, they're excited, and uh, they feel like they have a bond with you, and you may have never even talked to them before. Right. That's pretty special. We're part of their uh, extended family, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're cheering for us, not only on the field, but you know, doing foundation work yeah. that Gilbert does, or oh. you know, the administrative work that I'm doing over at Marion University. They want us to be successful, and uh, I couldn't get that back in North Carolina, even though I was born and raised in, in Eastern North Carolina, but I'm from Wisconsin. There it is. <laughs> I've been yeah. here that long too. I might as well say I'm from here too. So um, Gilbert Packer fans will never forget your nickname and that mm -hmm. dance, the Grave Digger. <laughs> it follows you to this day. 292 career tackles and seven sacks. And it seems like just yesterday you were pulling up at Burger King ordering the Gilbert Burger, right? right. <laughs> my job, my job was to make George look pretty. <laughs> Keep them big old fat nasty guys off of George. <laughs> that was my job. So uh, I enjoyed doing that, and I enjoyed e each one, each player. That's that was the thing about our team. Each player had a role, right. and we played it well, mm -hmm. and we loved doing it. And then coming to work every day, the, coming to, even then coming into work every day was like uh, like a uh, fraternity. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. we had a bunch of brothers just running around, and then when Mike Holmgren come down there, everybody. <laughs> stiffen up a little bit. <laughs> stiffen up a little bit. Then when the he leaves, we just mm -hmm. keep on with it. Like and it still exists kids. today. It, it yeah. still exists today. I love that. George, you have a career 652 tackles, and you played all three positions of right. linebacker. Right. And so uh, when you think about those days, like what really comes to mind oh, from the hits to just getting out there on the field? Well, I had a great time out there running around trying to, to trying to make some things happen, trying to help the Green Bay Packers win a game. But what really comes to mind for me is I had Gilbert Brown in front of me, Santana Dawson, the great Reggie White, and Sean Jones. So, uh, you know, Andrew, you could have made those type of tackles <laughs> behind those guys. And yeah. I, was, I, was, I was very, very fortunate to have players like my, my guy, uh, my best friend, Gilbert Brown, playing in front of me. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better scenario uh, than what I was in here in Green Bay. Yes, well, you guys have mentioned some of the things that you're doing to uh, make a difference in uh, the state of Wisconsin. You have your uh, foundation <coughs> work, and you've written a book, and all this right, good stuff. Right. We're going to talk about that. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we return to Our Issues Milwaukee, we'll continue our conversation with former Green Bay Packers Gilbert Brown and George Coons about life after football, and we'll also discuss a couple of different things that have been in the news. We'll do that right after this. <laughs> 